spectral geometer who works in Riemannian geometry like me, it is a memorable honor to introduce the next plenary speaker of the ICM 2022, who is Professor Tobias Hawk Colding from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Tobias' work has given fundamental contributions in differential geometry, geometric analysis, PDEs on manifolds, and this is the, the theme of his talk today, as well as low dimensional topology. Born in Copenhagen, Denmark, Tobias obtained his PhD at UPenn. During his professional career, Tobias held positions in several prestigious academic institutions, including the New York University, Princeton University, the MSRI, and the University of Copenhagen. He is or has been editor of prominent math journals like Annals of Mathematics and Acta Mathematica. Among his formidable accomplishments in mathematics, let me recall the work on the structure of minimal surfaces with bounded genus in three manifolds, most of which in collaboration with William Minikazi, and the work on the structure of manifolds with Ricci curvature bounded from below in collaboration with Jeff Cheeger. Finally, let me mention Tobias' work on the study of singularities of geometric flows, and especially the mean curvature flow with focus on the gravitational singularity. Also, I want to recall that Tobias was the awardee of several international prizes and fellowships, including the Sloan Research Fellowship, the Oswald Veblen Prize in Geometry, and the Carlsberg Foundation Research Prize. Without further ado, let me now welcome Tobias Kolding, who will give a plenary talk entitled Geometry of PDEs. Okay, so I, I want to talk about uh, geometry of PDEs, uh, and in particular how uh, geometry helps understand PDE and PDE helps understand geometry. First, a little bit about the equations that comes up. So optimal geometry and evolution of shape are governed by PDEs. Uh, the geometric invariance makes the PDE canonical. Uh, and it means that the same times of equations appear over and over again across many diverse areas. And the phenomena, the equation describe phenomena uh, that is also seemingly unrelated to geometry. Uh, okay, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, and so I will emphasize here, uh, right, so, so often the geometry uh, unlocks the structure uh, leading to fundamental uh, uh, tools in PDE. Understanding the geometry require insight into both analysis and geometry and the interplay between those, and we will see examples of this. I will emphasize a few big ideas uh, and themes, suppressing many other interesting aspects and results. But hopefully this will give you a taste for a large and very active area. And I will focus on joint work with Bill Minkotti. Um, the three examples that we will discuss are in optimal regularity in PDEs, in stability of solution, and in the geometry of the diffeomorphism group. Little bit about the three examples. So the first one, optimal regularity in PDE. In PDE, existence is often proved uh, weakly. This could be either in a viscosity sense or in a distribution sense. The challenge is then to prove regularity. In <clears throat> nonlinear PDE, uh, weak solutions might not be smooth. And the question is then how smooth are solutions and how large is the singular set? In dynamics, another of the three examples <clears throat> that we discuss is that in dynamics and PDE, a central question is which solutions are stable and which are not. The stable ones are the ones that physically happen in uh, the unstable ones are not seen in nature. 
the third of the three examples is about the diffeomorphism group. So geometric properties are invariant uh, of coordinates. Uh, yet, if you look at objects in different coordinates, they will look very different. And so the question is, how do we recognize geometric objects when there are no canonical uh, coordinates? And the answer to that will be to understand the geometry of the diffeomorphism group. So those are the three examples that we'll discuss where we'll see the interplay between uh, analysis and geometry. First, a little bit about some of the equations that come up, some of the geometric equation that comes up. So one is, uh, comes from surface tension. So <clears throat> surface tension give a PDE that describe the evolution of shape. Mathematically speaking, uh, surface tension is the mean curvature. Surface tension has the effect of causing water to form a roughly spherical droplets. Uh, and mathematically speaking, mean curvature is the sum of the principal curvatures. So if you have, a, um, if your surface is the level set of a function u, then the Unit normal is a normalized gradient, so the gradient divided by its norm, and the mean curvature is the divergence of the unit normal. If, <clears throat> if surface tension is the only force acting, then equilibrium occurs when the mean curvature is zero. Those are called minimal surfaces and has a long history going back to work of Euler and Lagrange. Um, if you, in general, when you're looking at evolution under surface tension, this is mathematically speaking called the mean curve to flow. And so a surface evolved by the mean curve to flow, if each position, each point <clears throat> is moving, each point on surface is moving normal to the surface with speed, the mean curvature. So the time derivative of the position vector is minus the mean curvature times the unit normal. <clears throat> and this, so this is the evolution that comes from surface tension, and it has the effect of that convex point moves inward, concave point moves out. Mean curvature flow is a nonlinear heat equation. It is the negative gradient flow for area, and <clears throat> it it, by, and, and it acts on the infinite dimensional space of surfaces. And it has the property that the, under the mean curve of flow, the area is shrinking the f in the fastest possible way. Mean curves of flow, <clears throat> both in mathematics and material science, go back more than 100 years. There's a couple of examples uh, when one think about mean curve of flow of surface tension evolution, not the surface tension that are worth keeping in mind. So one is the dumbbell. So if you're looking at, so this here is an example of a dumbbell. So, <clears throat> and it's rotational symmetric around an axis. And if you're looking at the evolution, so here the evolution go from left to right. Uh, and uh, in the top line first, and then the same in the line below. And so you're starting with a dumbbell, the, it's shrinking, everything is shrinking, the area is going fast as, uh, going down as fast as possible. And so in the beginning, what happened is that the neck is shrinking faster than the two bells. And so the neck will shrink and pinch off, and then you get, so you're starting with one component, the surface, and the neck is shrinking and pinching off, and you're left with two components. And the two components will, over time, they were shrinking and over time become rounder and rounder and shrink and disappear, um, both of them. And in this case, where the two bells have the same size, the two uh, spheres that, that, are, that appear in the end, almost round spheres will disappear at the same time. Yeah. Another example to keep in mind is, is the marriage ring. So the marriage ring is a thin torus of evolution. And under the mean curve of flow, it remains a, 
a torso of evolution, but it, it's shrinking and it eventually become extinct. It has become extinct, extinct in a round circle. When one <clears throat> try to understand the flow, one possible way of trying to understand it is uh, using a method, uh, very successful methods from applied mathematics called the level set methods. So the level set method is a way of tracking a moving front. So in this example, it could be a forest fire. And so the idea is that you are looking at the front, you think about the front as the level set of a function. And then you ask, so you have an equation and you're asking if the level sets are if the if the function if the if the evolving front are level set of a function what equation what pd does this function satisfy so that's the level set method <clears throat> and the level set one of the points about the level set method is that it's allowed for topological changes and singularities so in this example the gray, area, gray domain, it's a boundary of the gray domain that is the front that we're tracking. And so you see that the boundary here, it develops a singularity. And then there's a topological change. It goes from one component into two components. And so the <clears throat> images below is that you're thinking about the level, this, the, the boundary here as the level set of a function. So this is the function here. It's the, the the axis here is the function, the level, uh, the value of the function. <clears throat> and so, so this is the level set method. Now, if the flow, so I want to concentrate now on when the flow is moving in a monotone way. So this could be like a forest fire that once it have burned out an area, it's not going to return to that area. So if you're looking at a front that is moving monotonically, so the monotonically inward, uh, like in this picture, and in fact, in the two examples that we looked at, both the marriage ring and the dumbbell, it was moving monotonically inward. Then <clears throat> the so-called arrival time function, the arrival time function is the time when the front is, arrive, is arriving. Right? So since it's moving inwards, this gives you a well-defined function the time it arrived and then once it have arrived it's passing and it never returned that's the arrival time function and so the arrival time function has this property of course that the level set of the arrival time function are exactly the fronts right? and so in this case the arrival time function is going to be defined on the domain that the initial front is bounding uh, and um, and the equation that is satisfied if the fronts are moving with surface tension, the uh, equation that the, that the arrival time function is satisfying is this nonlinear elliptic degenerate. It's a degenerate elliptic PD. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple of examples of the arrival time function that would be useful to keep in mind for later on. So uh, we're looking at the arrival time function in the case of round spheres in our tree. That's the first example. In, in that case, the arrival time function is this quadratic polynomium. It's a, it's a quadratic homogeneous quadratic polynomium. And, <clears throat> and I have here normalized so that the sphere is becoming extinct at time zero. So they only live for negative time, okay? So this is the arrival time function for shrinking spheres. And, and you see, of course, all the level sets here are round spheres. The second example, keeping in mind, so this is coming, this is this picture here, is the arrival time function for shrinking cylinders. So here we have normalized it so that the cylinders become extinct in the line, in the line x2 equal to x3 equal to zero, also at time t equal to zero. So again, the shrinking round cylinders live only for negative time. And then at time zero, they become extinct in a line. So this is again, a quadratic, a homogeneous quadratic polynomial. Okay. 
Now, <clears throat> the arrival time function as, as the level set methods are central in applied mathematics. They go back to Osha and Session. They also arrive, arises in game theory and they fit into a larger family of natural PDs. And so Evans, Brook, Cheng, Giga, Gita, and Godo, they proved that for the arrival time functions, function, uh, viscosity solution exists. And those uh, solutions are Lipschitz. And so the fundamental question is how smooth are solutions? Is Lipschitz the best one can do? <clears throat> and, but then there are examples of Tom Ilmanen that show that in general solutions are not C2. Okay. Let me just say a word about viscosity solutions. So viscosity solution is one of two weak solutions that I discussed in the beginning. Another, uh, another type of weak solutions are distribution in the distribution sense. But here we focus on viscosity solution. So a viscosity solution, <clears throat> this is a continuous function that satisfy a PDE in a weak sense. And so here I'm just illustrating it with that. What does it mean for a continuous function to be subharmonic? So a function is just continuous. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily even have one derivative, let alone two derivatives. So that it is subharmonic in the viscosity sense means that there exists a smooth barrier that lie below it. And if you want to say that it is subharmonic at a point, let's say that that point is x equal to zero, then <clears throat> you want the barrier function to lie below the given function, and you want to touch that it touches it at, at uh, so it has the same value at zero as, as the given function u. And then the barrier function that is smooth, that should be subharmonic. So if that's the case, then you say that the original continuous function u is subharmonic at zero. Uh, and if it's subharmonic everywhere, then actually the maximum principle holds for the original function u. So this is the guiding principle that you want the maximum principle to hold for functions that are just continuous. Okay? So this is, the, this is the viscosity sense. Uh, of being a solution. This is, of course, uh, uh, the example here is the viscosity sense of being a subsolution, but you can imagine that you have that it is a viscosity, both a super and subsolution. Okay. And so the, the point here is that using PD techniques alone, you can prove that solution as Chen, as Evan and Spruck and Chen, Giga and Goda did, they were able to prove they were able to show that viscosity solution exists, and they were able to prove that solutions were slipshits. But if you use geometry, you can do better. <clears throat> and so this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the content of this theorem, that the, fun that the solution is not only Lipschitz, but it's actually twice differentiable, twice differentiable everywhere. It's not always C2, right? We already know that there are six examples where it's not C2. So, so the function is twice differentiable. So the second derivative exists everywhere, but the second derivative may not be continuous, right? In fact, there are examples where the second derivative is discontinuous, okay? So using geometry, you can actually prove that, uh, that the second derivative exists everywhere. And you can also show that being C2 uh, has, which is of course just an analytical, uh, an analytical property that actually that, that has geometric meaning. And so the geometric meaning of being C2 is that if the, <clears throat> that the arrival time function is C2, if and only if the entire evolving front becomes singular at the same time, and then extinct. So this is the precise geometric meaning of that a function being C2 in this case, okay? And so the example, we see that <clears throat> in the example of the round spheres, for instance, or the marriage ring, the entire evolution became singular. In the case of the marriage ring, the entire 
evolution became singular at just one time, namely where it disappeared in a round circle, right? In the case of the dumbbell, that's not the case, right? In that case, you had a neck pinch first, and then you had the, the two bells disappeared. So they are two different singular times. So in that case, the arrival time function is not C2, right? I mean, that's the content, I mean, in, in, in this, of the, of the theorem here. Right? Now, <clears throat> how do we prove, so you, you might ask, how do you prove that, how do you use geometry to prove, to, to do better, to prove that actually the arrival time function is twice differentiable everywhere? Well, in order to explain that, let's just review what does it even mean for a function of a single variable to be differentiable, right? So one way of thinking about a function of a single variable as being differentiable is that it looks like a linear function on all small scales, and it has to look at, this as, at the same, as the same linear function on all small scales, right? So here you have a function, nice function, the blue is a function we're looking at. <clears throat> and uh, if we're looking at it at one scale, it looks kind of like a, this linear function. If we blow it up here, it looks like the same linear function. And here we blow it up even more. And this looks like the same function. So it's a good bet that this function is actually differentiable. Right? So <clears throat> now, now let's look at an example where this is not the case. So this is, you can look at any kind of fractal. So this is the cock curve. The cock curve is a fractal. It's given as a iterate limit of broken lines. So you're starting with a line, you break it, you take the middle third of it and you insert a break like this. And now you take this, you think about this line here, and you take the middle third and you insert a break and you do that the same thing here and the same thing here and here. And now you repeat this process and you go to a limit and in the limit <clears throat> you get the cock curve. And so the cock curve, if, if this break here, so <clears throat> just visually I made the break, break quite large, but if you make the break flat, then on each scale, it will look roughly like a line. But as you zoom in, you zoom in more and more, it, it will look like different lines. So you can, in fact, if you zoom in more and more, you can get, if you zoom in over here, initially it looks like this line. If you zoom in over here, you can get any other line you want. You can get any line you want, okay? So the cock curve, of course, it's not differentiable, right? because it looks like a line on each scale, but it doesn't look like the same line on each scale, okay? And, and so now let's try to prove that. So we want to prove that a function is twice differentiable. Right? And so how do we do that? Kind of inspired by, by this example. So we wanna define, we take a function, and we want to define rescaling of it, okay? Now, if you're looking at the equation that we're looking at, the arrival time equation, that's a degenerate elliptic, uh, nonlinear elliptic PD, okay? It's a degenerate, uh, but if you're looking at points where the gradient does not vanish, at that, those points, the, it's not a degenerate equation anymore. So it's actually standard that when the gradient does not vanish, it's standard that the function is smooth. So the point you have to worry about is where the gradient vanishes, okay? And so you, and <clears throat> points where gradient vanishes, another way of saying that, that's the critical point, okay? So you're looking at a critical point and you want to prove that the function is twice differentiable at this critical point. So let's say, just for simplicity, let's say that zero is, is a critical point. The origin in space is the critical point. Now you <clears throat> define every scaling. So this here is supposed to capture second order uh, behavior. 
So you're looking at rescaling. So <clears throat> uh, like this, this is the rescale function. And the rescale function here will satisfy the same equation. Okay, so it also satisfies the arrival time equation. If the initial function u is a homogeneous quadratic polynomial, then actually this rescaling will preserve the, uh, the polynomial, the quadratic polynomial. And so in the two examples that we looked at, <clears throat> where we looked at specifically the arrival sum function, namely the case of shrinking round cylinders and shrinking round spheres, in both of those examples, the arrival sum functions was quadratic polynomial, homogeneous quadratic polynomial. And so in both of those cases, the, this rescaling leave the function invariant. Okay. Now, <clears throat> That a function is twice differentiable means that the that it has a second order tail expansion, uh, right? So that's another way of saying that a function is twice differentiable. And so what we must show is that we, if we're looking at the at a function u, we want to show that it's twice differentiable. Then we want to show that that as we're looking at rescalings here, they have a limit as lambda goes to zero. Okay. And so, a priori, there's no reason to expect any limit. Okay. Um, uh, in 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 general, Quiskin, Ilman, and White, they get that geometric. You get geometric blowups, but the blowups in a weak sense, and the, but the blowups depend on the choice of subsequence that you're blowing up with. So, just like in the example of the cock curve, right? In general, <clears throat> for flows, uh, you have that blowups are, uh, at least the flow we will discuss here, are um, uh, 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 dilation invariant, and they are called shrinkers. Right? And so the question is, again, is it possible that as you are looking at the arrival time function and you're looking at this rescaling V lambda, is it possible that you can get different blowups as you are rescaling by different sequences, lambda i go to, to zero, okay? Um, right, so <clears throat> in the case of monotone flows, the, the level sets converge to cylinders or spheres. So the, 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 the right, so, um, and, but, but the question is, do they converge as you're blowing up? Uh, can you get different cylinders, say, by blowing up with different uh, sequences, lambda i equal to zero? Okay. And so <clears throat> this is what we proved, that this is not the case, that you always get the same limit when it, uh, on the sequence uh, that you're blowing up. And so this type of uniqueness question has a long history and has long been recognized in geometry as an absolute fundamental question, whether uh, sequences in, in geometric problems uh, where you have a PDE, whether blowups are unique or not, okay? And there are fundamental work of Allard and Almgren and Liam Simon on this for minimal varieties. So <clears throat> Bill and I proved then, so we had uniqueness. We proved that uniqueness, once you have uniqueness, we proved that uniqueness imply that the function looks like a quadratic polynomial on a sufficiently small scale. And it looks like the same quadratic polynomial on all sufficiently small scales. So this gives you a, tail, a second order tail expansion and twice differentiability. Now, in the beginning, we talked about, so this is like the first example of how the geometry helps you prove result in PDE that PDE methods alone cannot do. Another fundamental question is in PDE is once you have a nonlinear PDE and solutions are not smooth everywhere, how smooth, how large are the singular sets? 
So in this example of the merit ring, uh, uh, the singular set right, is just the curve, the, the round circle that is disappearing in, that is a singular set. <clears throat> Brian White using dimension reduction proved that uh, in, so this is not three, but similar, similar results hold in all dimension. Uh, that, uh, that in general, uh, the singular set is, is one dimensional, but, but it could have infinite dimensional measure, infinite dimensional one dimensional measure. Uh, <clears throat> the example of course of the cock curve is an example where you have infinite length. Right? So using uniqueness again, uh, Bill and I proved that, uh, that in fact, the singular set has a nice structure. In particular, it has one, a finite one dimensional measure. Okay. And so again, similar result to this holds in all dimension. <clears throat> Another way of thinking about uniqueness is to think about it dynamically. And so <clears throat> you can think about it dynamically for what's called the rescale flow. The rescale flow is instead of lo looking at a sequence, a discrete sequence going to zero, where you're blowing up, you're magnifying, then you can, as you're flowing along, you can continuously magnify. If you continuously magnify, then you get the rescale flow. And so <clears throat> uniqueness, uniqueness for the rescale, uniqueness is the same as saying that for the rescale flow, if you have a limit point, then you have a unique limit. Okay. And so this contrast, uh, um, what's called a wandering set in dynamics, a wandering set is a wandering point or set in dynamics is where you have something that keep going around space. It may return infinite often to the same point, but once it returns, it go away again. That's a wandering point. And so uniqueness is, is exactly contrasting this. <clears throat> the rescale flow, the rescale flow you can think about in another way also. The rescale flow is, is another infinite dimensional gradient flow. It's an infinite dimensional gradient flow for the Gaussian surface area. So the Gaussian surface area that, that has appeared also in theoretical computer science and various other areas, that is where you take a Gaussian and you take a submanifold, <clears throat> and then you take a Gaussian and you integrate the Gaussian over the submanifold. Quiskin proved <clears throat> that if you take uh, the rescaled mean curve to flow where you are rescaling around the origin, then the Gaussian surface area is monotone under the flow. It's monotone, non-increasing under the flow. And so this give you another way of thinking about singularities. So singularities at the origin can then be thought of as critical points for the uh, Gaussian surface area. Or if you want to think about it in terms of the rescale flow, they are equilibrium for the rescale flow. There's another functional that is actually more useful to, for, to understand the dynamics than the, than the uh, Gaussian surface area. And that is the entropy. And, <clears throat> and this is because the entropy is a Lyapunov functional for, for uh, both the original flow, the original mean curve to flow and any rescale flow, not just a rescale flow around the origin. And a Lyapunov functional for flow, right, is a function that is monotone under the flow they were studied by Lyapunov, we'll get to this in a second. They were studied by Lyapunov and they were studied uh, and were used by Lyapunov to understand stability of the flow. Okay. Now, in the, so the entropy here is uh, the soup, where you're taking soup, you can either think about soup over all Gaussians with different centers and different scales, or you can take your submanifold and you can scale the submanifold by a, a positive constant T0 and then translate it 
by axiom. So you're looking at sub, if you do it like that, you do it over the original Gaussian surface here. So this gives you a Lyapunov function. Uh, and it's again, it's a Lyapunov function both for the mean curves of flow and on rescaled mean curves of flow. If you take, <clears throat> so the next thing I want to do is I want to use this Lyapunov function to understand stability of the flow. Okay. If you take a catenoid, so a catenoid is a minimal surface. And a catenoid, if you take a small piece, if you take any minimal surface and you take a small piece, then it's stable. But if you take a catenoid and you take a very large piece of the catenoid, then it's unstable. Unstable mean that if you perturb it ever so slightly, it will completely change and go away from itself. It will, it will get to some completely different shape. And so this is a four snapshot of a film that illustrates this. Right, they're starting out to the left. This is part of a catenoid. It's supposed to be a large part of the catenoid. You perturb it ever so slightly, and, and it changes completely. Okay. And so again, <clears throat> if you take something that is unstable, then you won't see it in nature. And so you can ask for the flow. For the flow, you can ask, what are the singularities that are stable? Which one do you see in nature? I mean, there might be many, and indeed there are infinitely many singularities that are possible, but very few you actually will see in nature. Okay. And, <clears throat> and so you're asking, you take the flow, you take this flow that is given by surface tension, and you're asking, what are the stable singularities? What are the singularities that cannot be perturbed away? So this is for a general flow that is not necessarily monotone. And so again, in dynamical system stability um, was studied by Lyapunov near uh, equilibrium. Uh, and and if, if you have a, a flow <clears throat> that starts near equilibrium, and if it always stay near the equilibrium, then that equilibrium is said to be stable. Right? And so, <clears throat> um, so we're looking at, at this flow from surface tension coming from surface tension, the generic singularity, what we call generic singularities, are the singularities that are stable, the singularities that cannot be perturbed away. And so <clears throat> what we proved is that the only singularities that cannot be perturbed away, this hold in all dimension, are shrinking spheres and shrinking cylinders. Okay. So that, that, that is the second of this, give you a, a taste of the second of these three examples that, uh, that we want to look at. The third example is, um, is about recognizing singularities. So <clears throat> if one have a flow and one approach a singularity, and one magnify, so you should think about the evolving front. The evolving front is typically compact, right? And you should, and, but if you, when you want to rescale and you go to a limit, then that limit is typically non-compact, okay? So as you're going towards a singularity and you rescale at any given time, you would only see part of the singularity. And as you're going further in, further in time, and you get closer to the actual singularity, you'll be scaling more, you'll see more of the singularity. But at any given time, you only see a finite part of the singularity. And so <clears throat> another fundamental question to understand the flow is, is a finite part, can you recognize the singularity by just knowing a finite part of the singularity, okay? And so this is, <clears throat> so, so this is kind of like, you can ask this more generally, this question, can you recognize the whole from a finite part? And so this is not at all typical in PDE. So this here is, <clears throat> so in this example here, we take a harmonic function, take a simple harmonic function, this is actually a harmonic function on R2. I just take the complex exponential. 
function <clears throat> and I take the real part of that. And if I look at that and I look at, uh, at a finite piece, if I'm looking where X is very negative, then the function looks virtually constant, right? So if you are where it's virtually where very negative, it will look eccentrically like a constant function. If you are where X is very positive, then it will be highly oscillatory, right? And so if you zoom in at a point where <clears throat> X is very negative, you would think that this is just a plane you're seeing. It's just a constant function you're seeing. But this is, of course, not at all the case. In geometry, this is not a standard thing either. <clears throat> and so a sort of famous example of this is um, is what's called gravitational instantons. So these are rigid flat manifolds. And you have rigid flat manifolds where you have arbitrary large pieces that are as close to Euclidean pieces as you want. Okay. So if you're looking at them <clears throat> at certain spots, you would think that this is just flat Euclidean space, but it's not at all flat. <clears throat> okay. So in contrast to this, is strong rigidity. So strong rigidity, <clears throat> uh, and so this is, and this is strong rigidity for the most important singularities. And so this strong rigidity, it requires really only that you know a compact piece. If you can recognize a compact piece of the space, then you can actually recognize the whole uh, space. Okay, so that's strong rigidity. And strong rigidity, it's worth emphasizing that knowing it, uh, you only need to know roughly what it looks like, right? It's, you don't know, it, you don't need to know exactly what you look like. This is what in, in, as you're zooming in, you will never know exactly what it looks like, but you will know roughly what it looks like, okay? So, and so this, <clears throat> strong rigidity is, is the Schringer principle. And the Schringer principle is that uniqueness is radiating out. Uniqueness is radiating out from a compact set. And so this was <clears throat> originally discovered in mean curve to flow. And it was originally discovered in joint work of myself and Tom Illman and Bill. And so we proved that the generic singularity are strongly rigid, so a compact piece just determine the entire space. <clears throat> and again, for most PDE, this would be unreasonable. Um, it would be unreasonable to expect that a finite part would determine the whole space. Uh, and the Stringer principle is another example where actually the geometry of the situation helps unlock the structure of the PDE. The PDE uh, <clears throat> that's the, the, the Schringer equation that, that this here is about, is another nonlinear PD. Okay. The Schringer principle also holds for other equations. Okay. And, and so let me discuss another equation where the Schringer principle holds for. And so this is the Richer flow. The Richer flow is a system of PDEs that was introduced by Hamilton. And they describe the evolution of a metric on a manifold. And so <clears throat> what we proved is that the Schringer principle also holds for Ritchie flow. So it also, so also for Ritchie flow, <clears throat> you get that the most important singularities are, are rigid, are strongly rigid, so that you can recognize the entire space from just knowing a compact piece of it. Okay. And so a special case of this <clears throat> was also proven independently by Li and Wang using result of Brendel and culture. Now, <clears throat> what are the other features in the, for the Ritchie flow that didn't appear in the mean curvature flow? So one of the major issues in Ritchie flow is the gauge group. And so the thing is again that, so this is the third of these examples where, where the geometry helps you uh, unlock the structure of the PDE. So <clears throat> to recognize a metric, uh, you need to look at it in the right way. 
right? So if you're looking at a metric in the, in the wrong coordinates, it may look unrecognizable. So if you have two metrics, you, that could even be the same. And you have two different coordinate systems. If you write down the metric in one and you write down the metric in the other and you compare, then they may look completely different, okay? And you wouldn't really be able to tell that they are the same. And so, <clears throat> um, but in order to, to reconcile this, then what we need to do is we need to understand the infinite the geometry of the infinite dimensional group of diffeomorphism, which is the gauge group. And in this case, it's an infinite dimensional group acting on a non-compact space. It's a non-compact shrinker. It's a non-compact blow up of the flow. And so to find the right gauge, we, we need to solve a nonlinear PDE. Right? So to find the right gauge, we need to solve the nonlinear PDE being a PDE, this gives you a diffeomorphism phi. And then we need to prove that the right gauge is uh, orthogonal. So the right gauge, so, so this PDE, sorry, the PDE that we find is constructed so that the right gauge is orthogonal to the action of the infinimensional group of diffeomorphism. So it's a nonlinear, it's a nonlinear system of PDEs that you need to solve first. And then you need to prove, so, you, so again, you have, you, 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 you're trying to, you, you're zooming in at a singularity and you wanna see is this, you wanna, you, and you can see just a finite piece of it. And you want to, you're hoping to, you, you, you wanna see if a finite part of this tells you what the singularity is. But as you're looking at it, you may look at it in the wrong coordinates. So you may not be able to see exactly what it is. Okay. And, and so for this, right, <clears throat> we, 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 we find the right gauge, we're solving this nonlinear PDE. The PDE is constructed so that the right gauge is orthogonal to the group action. And then we show uh, optimal bounds for the displacement. So the displacement is how much this diffeomorphism differ from the given, uh, the given one, right? Uh, and, right? And so this measure how different the, 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 the right gauge is from the given one. And so now, okay, so here's what we have uh, discussed. So this is like a concluding remark. So here's what we have discussed. We have looked at several canonical equations uh, where a number of key issues come up. Uh, we've seen the interplay between the analysis and geometry. And in particular, we have seen how analysis helps uh, understand the geometry. Without the analysis, you could not understand the geometry. But we have also seen how the geometry unlocks the analysis uh, and, and leads to, uh, to new results uh, that are purely analytical. Uh, examples of this were for the optimal regularity. So instead of just that solutions for these uh, degenerate elliptic equations were Lipschitz, then we get that the solutions are twice differentiable and you can even characterize when the uh, when they're C2, when the second derivative is continuous. We've looked at stability of solutions for flow. So the singularities that could not be perturbed away. Uh, and then finally, we have looked at the geometry of the, of the diffeomorphism group uh, and how the geometry of the diffeomorphism group helps you understand the so-called gauge problem, namely that you could have two objects uh, that even could be the same, but they could look wildly different because they, you're looking at it in different gauge, okay? So this, this uh, right, so this is kind of outline, this is uh, sort of sum up with uh, the, 
with the different uh, right how the analysis and the geometry interplay and how one uh, the analysis helps you understand the geometry and the geometry helps you understand the analysis I would like to thank the speaker um, on behalf of the IMU for his beautiful talk on the singularities of solutions of PDEs and especially the interplay between geometry and analysis. I'm absolutely sure that the audience all around the world who has participated remotely has enjoyed the presentation. Thank you and greetings from Brazil. <laughs>